Ramsey Solutions, it's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. We help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Open phones this hour. Rachel Cruz, number one best-selling author, Ramsey personality. My daughter is my co-host today. Open phones again, 888-825-5225. Well, Rachel, I was right and I was wrong. Oh. Okay, I'll, 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 take, I'll take both of these. <laughs> yeah, this, these are good. Sides. I was 100% wrong. I thought that Washington would never actually do anything except bloviate and carry on about student loan forgiveness. The President Biden is announcing today that he is actually doing it. I'm guessing that the that he's doing that with an executive order, and I'm guessing there will be some legal challenges to that because I don't know if he has the legal right to do that with an executive order. I'm not a constitutional expert. We'll see about all that. But he is doing it. The thing I was right about was I was 100% sure that this ridiculously failed presidency was going to do a Hail Mary going into the midterms. And I knew, I told you guys, I've told you guys over the air here several times in the past several weeks that he was going to do an announcement this week, the week before the student loan uh, interest rate uh, forgiveness, the repayment repayment was going to restart on August 31st. I was 100% sure he was going to extend that and announce something about some kind of student loan forgiveness. I said that was going to happen. I also said that when it happened, it would not amount to anything that it would be a bunch of political crap, and when you read the fine print, that nothing would happen. But this appears to actually have some teeth. So it I'm has gonna, something. Well, he, I was wrong about that. And so, as we're speaking right now, though, the press conference has not gone live. We've just seen what... Well, the White House is releasing the details. What they, I mean. Well, they've released some of it, yes, but I'm curious here in the next few hours when the press conference, what, what actually the details of it and what ends up happening, because... It appears. A, it yes. appears that if you have yep. that, that it, up to ten thousand dollars will be forgiven if you make less than one hundred twenty five thousand dollars a year in student loans. It appears that public make, loans, not le, private. Public, not private. Mm-hmm. Um, and one guy already tweeted and said, "My mortgage is now self identifying as a student loan." Oh, no. So just to, just to let you know. Um, but the <laughs> not working, bud. I'm sorry. Uh, but the second thing that happened was uh, if you're if you're a Pell Grant recipient, uh, meaning that you were in there on a Uh, you were struggling, you're at the poverty level or whatever, uh, when you went into school, uh, then you get up to $20,000 forgiven if you make less than $125,000 a year. This appears to affect about 20 million student loans. Uh, I mean, student loan uh, holders. Uh, And so out of the 43 million. So it's pretty substantial. So here's our take on this. We've been talking about it around here for a couple of days because we, you know, they, they telescoped that this was coming, telegraphed this was coming in a sense. Um, that number one, first and foremost, if you are a $10,000 student loan person and you make less than 125,000 and that's, this is getting ready to be forgiven. Uh, we're happy for you. We want good things for you. We're happy for you. We we're glad you got we want you out of debt as quickly as we possible. want you yep. to get out of debt and we're happy for you as individuals. We're also simultaneously angry on behalf of the people who paid off their loans and uh, feel screwed. And you know why they feel screwed is because they got screwed. That's why they feel screwed. And um, we're also angry that this is an obvious political ploy when this presidency from an economic standpoint is the greatest failure since Jimmy Carter. We have the highest inflation. The gas pump will make you puke. Your fill up your buggy at the grocery store, it'll make you puke. Your interest rates on your homes are up. The housing market has slowed down. We're in a recession. We are, we may be, we were with the last two quarters, we were in a session where we may be recovering from a light recession. It's not much of a recession, but it's a recession, which by God, the economy is not prospering. Oh, and they just passed the largest spending bill in history. To add to this, and this uh, move of the stroke of a pen of $10,000 forgiveness amounts to about $300 billion, with a B, more debt. So you people listening just paid off all these other people's student loan debt. And your grandkids paid them off. And so while we are happy for you individuals, and we are, this slide towards socialism with this extreme left wing nuts uh, is good. It's out of control. It's completely out of control. 
This is a failed presidency. The, the Democrats are going to have a bloodbath at the midterms. They're going to get thrown out like no other party's ever been thrown out. And you can go ahead and mark that word down. And if I'm wrong, I'll come back and say I was wrong like I did a minute ago. But if I'm right, I'm going to say I told you so, too. But it's coming. Americans are sick of the wackiness coming out of the island of misfit toys known as Washington, D.C. They are sick of it. And they're going to fire a bunch of people's butts with a D after their name. And this guy, this little move right here is not going to save it. It's not going to keep that from happening because everybody's pretty aware that when you walk up to a gas pump and there's a sticker on it with a Biden that says, I did that. And you're looking at your gas. You know, I filled up my truck. I had, you know, when they cut it off at $100, you have to do it again because the so I'm like, oh, I'm running my my debit card in there in and out. You know, people know what's going on in the midst of this. Right. Just so you know, before we went on the air, I was like, hey, as we talk about this, (laughs) let's do like a book about the American and a little bit about the about about political because here's the deal regardless of who gets it in, is political it that's is. the only reason it happened it is but regardless of who gets in in November that's not going to change your life people listening like no it's not going to change your life regardless of and what other, happens the other in November and who's in Washington DC they're all an island of misfit toys and if you want to change your life you have to believe in the power of yourself and that you can do it absolutely and you ought to so also ought to call your congressman and tell him you're going to fire them because they continue to make student loans that too so what about the guy who takes out student loans next week? What are you going to do to help him? You, you bozos keep making these loans, but they're so bad you have to forgive them because Americans are being oppressed by you. This is talking out of both sides of your mouth. This is so intellectually dishonest. If they're so bad you have to cancel them, why are you continuing to make them? You should at least stop making them before we start, start forgiving them. It's just intellectually dishonest, and it's it's an obvious political ploy. It is, yes. It's a ploy. I, yes. It's a, I, it was a campaign promise. For a it, year and a half, you've was. been in office. Why said. did it take you a year and a half? If I make a promise, I don't have to wait a year and a half to fulfill it. I can just do it. It's yeah. just like that. God, this is aggravating. Well, but and it's just the whole industry, though, because the whole industry, the industry is, is so, so predatory. It's so predatory, and these 18-year-olds. You can't buy beer, but you can go $100,000 in debt. Yeah. It's just dumber than crap. Well, and the people that and, and these kids too that like that's the that's the part of your first the first part of what you were saying of the individuals that are happy because this whole thing is it is so pre- like it, student loans it it, it is yeah. this lie that has been accepted. So stop it. So, so those so of you that have your loans forgiven, we're happy for you. The rest of you, we're pissed off as you are. Cuz you got to pay the bill. And nobody asked you if you wanted to pay the bill. You just got told you're going to pay the bill. That's not nice. It's bad politics. The timing is obviously politics. This is The Ramsey Show. Chaos. That's what it can feel like when your business is growing so fast you've outgrown your financial and accounting software. The faster you grow, the more likely you are to lose control of the numbers. And here's the reality. If you don't know your numbers, you don't know your business. That's why we use NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. Over 28,000 companies use NetSuite by Oracle, including Ramsey Solutions, because NetSuite gives us a single view of everything we need to make daily decisions. Whether you're making a few million to hundreds of millions a year, NetSuite gives you the visibility and control of the things you need to grow, like your financials, inventory, HR, planning, budgeting, and more, all in one dashboard. Go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey right now to get their free white paper. Jumpstart your CFO career.
Rachel Cruz, number one best-selling author, Ramsey personality, my daughter, is my co-host today as we take your questions about your life and your money. And before we do pick up the phones, I want to reiterate what Rachel was saying, because that is, after all, the overall stance of Ramsey, is that if I, I the, the other problem with the student loan forgiveness is it makes you feel more dependent on Washington for your prosperity. And they have never been good at delivering prosperity to you. You are the secret sauce in your life. You take control of your life. You get up, leave the cave, you kill something, you drag it home. If you're sitting around waiting on Washington to fix your life, this is like asking the DMV to be efficient. You know, this is not going to work. Your, your life's going to suck. So we want you to have an awesome, prosperous, abundant life. And that is never dependent upon the government. They have never delivered an awesome, prosperous, abundant life to anyone except defense contractors and lobbyists. But other than that, the rest of us have to go make our own way. And, you know, the more people's emotions and psychology and spiritual leanings are toward dependence on the yeah. government, the more your life is going to suck. And we don't want that for you. We want you to win. The people that we know that have wonderful lives, that become Baby Steps millionaires, that get out of debt, that are outrageously generous, that have great marriages, none of that was delivered to them in an envelope from D.C. Because there's also something to be said and we talk to them every day on the show people that have paid off debt and the emotional process that it takes and the sacrifice like the things that are built in that process of baby step two of paying off debt yeah the growth there is something there that carries you yep. when you become wealthy and so one of my fears is i'm like i just don't want a stroke of a pen again if it's you that has that ten thousand dollars and it's done you know we are here we want you debt free we want you debt free uh, We're happy but for also you. there's an easy button that they're allowing mm -hmm. this to occur. And most people have more than $10,000 on average. It's, it's 38 to $42,000. So there's so much more. And so the, stealing, now they're gonna, but now they're going to sit around and wait on the next wave of forgiveness. Like they sat around and wait on the next wave of Biden bucks or the next wave of, um, PPP loans or the next wave of COVID bailout of some kind. Out of and Washington if from you, both if parties. You, if you become dependent yeah. on that. Uh, you've got to wean yourself from it. I mean, you've got you got to get off the off the dole from Washington in order to be prosperous. And um, it's just it, it's just a sickness that runs really. It's a rotten smell in the air um, for for the for the nation as a whole, uh, for what drives our economy, what drives our freedoms, all of that. And so, anything that just causes you to be more and more dependent. I mean, I came out against the PPP loans. I came out against all that stuff in COVID. I didn't take any of it. I told churches not to take it because I told them it's going to cost them back later. I, I you know, I, I tell people don't get on the government dole because it, once you break through that and you just like, ah, oh, man, you just become dependent on it. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's really scary. All right, let's go to the phones. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Kevin is in California. Hi, Kevin. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thanks, Dave. Great to be here. Good. How can I help? So I'm on baby step seven, and our next financial goal is to invest in real estate. Um, it's going to be quite some time before we can afford to buy something in cash, but I'm wanting to educate myself on the process in advance. And several times I've heard you say that you should never buy rental property at retail value. You should always get it at a discount. And if there isn't going to be a housing crash, which I was expecting, but you've given valid arguments as to why that's not going to happen, then how do you go about finding these deals when the competition in the area is so steep and so much of the competition knows more about real estate than I do because they're experts and I'm not? Um, it's hard, but they're there. Uh, there's not many deals out there today, but as the economy continues too slow and the, we don't have 27 buyers lined up every time someone, put, someone puts up a for sale sign, then you're going to see more and more deals happen. The other thing that's going to happen is there's been virtually no foreclosures uh, for the last two years because of COVID moratoriums. And so there's a backlog of foreclosures getting ready to hit the market. Um, and there may be some deals in that pile. There may be some stuff that pops okay. up in that pile. I don't know for sure, but there may be. Um, the, uh, uh, 
but you know, the first deal is the hardest. It's like the first team member I ever hired here was much harder than the 1000th team member that we hired here. It was much weightier that it was a decision I wasn't used to making uh, the, the process and the steps. It was very, very hard. So, uh, but you know, we're, we're always, you know, old buddy of mine, uh, 30, 40 years ago, that was a house buyer, um, used to say we're driving for dogs and he would drive around looking for a house. that was a dog. And that means the uh, weeds are grown up, the gutters hanging off. Um, the bushes are overgrown on the house. It looks like a, an estate plan that's gone, uh, an estate deal that's gone sideways. It looks like a foreclosure that's happened. Uh, it looks like somebody, you know, there's something distressed about the property. And so that, I smell a bargain, you know, when I see that kind of stuff. If everything's in perfect condition, there's not a blade of grass out of place and an OCD member of the community is out there picking every little weed out from around their bushes, that's not going to be a deal usually. You know, and so you're driving for dogs, you're looking for that, you're going to make contacts with estate attorneys, you're going to make contacts with foreclosure attorneys, you're going to make contacts with marriage counselors, whoever you can find in the area that might know where there's a property that needs to be sold. Well, divorces cause this. I know, I know. And some, I mean, you're a blessing if you come in and buy a house and it helps people that are going through a divorce. Yeah. Um, but not at a deal. I mean, well, at a deal. deal. It can be at a deal. I mean, it's uh, it, rather than them get, you know, messed up. You yeah. know, and so get into foreclosure or something. So um, sometimes, you know, the, the, you know, you just clean the so, somebody's in a situation where they just want the thing turned quick. Yep. And that's where these, the these you see these little signs up. We buy houses and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they're all offering 70, 65, 75 cents on the dollar. And is that the formula you you use? I, for? use, I used 70 cents in the old days minus repairs. When I was buying houses. And fixing them and flipping them or fixing them and holding them. Commercial real estate, I'm a little different on. It's a little harder to uh, do that because there's more variables involved. And we mainly buy commercial real estate today. I've got a bunch of houses, but they're kind of left over from the old days. But, um, yeah, it, it's a, just take your time, learn, and buy the deal. And if you can't buy the deal, that means you're just not ready to buy. You haven't found it yet. You haven't looked hard enough. And when I was doing these deals a thousand years ago, Kevin, I'm a, I was buying foreclosures for a living. I would go through 200 deals to buy one. It is not, I mean, even when I was looking at foreclosures, not all of them are a deal. Some people had more owed on the house than it was worth. And that's why I was getting foreclosed on. Why would I want to pay, pay that for it? And so, you know, I'm scratching and clawing through a whole pile of stuff, looking for a needle in a haystack. And that's what you're doing. Take your time, take your time, take your time. Because, dude, if you buy a $400,000 house for 250000 you know, you've made money coming out of the gate. Which and is kind of, which is your strategy for yeah, uh, investment. You make, money property, at the, yeah. make money at the buy. Mm -hmm. Make money at the buy. Uh, there's very few pieces of property I've ever paid retail for. Very, very few. And uh, I've come out on all of those as well because they do go up in value too. But, you don't. It's, it's better to start out ahead of the game from day one. Josh is with us in Charleston, South Carolina. Hey, Josh, what's up? Hey, Dave. I appreciate you taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Well, I'm looking for your advice today. Um, just a uh, quick background. My dad introduced me to you probably 12 years ago when I was in college. And so I guess I know your baby steps <laughs> and your advice most of the time backwards and forwards, but I'm just finding myself in a position that I really need your guidance on what you would do if you find yourself in a situation. So um, earlier this year, um, in January, um, I lost my father. Oh, very sorry. Sorry. And thank you. Um, and so I am, you know, my mom's looking to me for advice uh, as far as what to do with um, the life insurance money. Okay, we'll help you with that. You hang on and uh, we'll come back from this break and make sure We'll get you some help on that. I'm so sorry for your loss. This is The Ramsey Show. is full of firsts. As the first 
oldest and longest serving Christian health cost sharing ministry, CHM has shared medical expenses for its members since 1981. We believe you should have the freedom to focus on your health while being supported by a community of believers, giving you the opportunity to create many more firsts. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Uh, we're talking with Josh. Josh is in his early 30s. His dad passed away in January, and he's asking what to do to help his mom. That's about how far we got in the conversation. Josh, I'm so sorry. Well, I appreciate it. What, what, know, ha- he, what, happened, uh, with him? what happened to him? You know, the doctors ruled it a heart attack, um, but it was something that he was fine at lunchtime. He walked into the ambulance and didn't didn't come out. So Man, it was something wow. that just happened. That oh. just happened very very suddenly within. How, how old was he? Fifty seven. Whoa! Oh gosh, Josh, I'm yeah. sorry. Wow. Man, oh man. Yeah, and so yeah, and so uh, how much know, how much got, life insurance did your mom get? Around three hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. Wow. And so he had all of the debt paid off, except for his vehicle, which we're working through now just to sell it. Um, right. My mom purchased the car in cash, mm-hmm. and so now she just has the mortgage. How much um, is the mortgage? But the mortgage left is two twenty five. Okay. What does she do for a living? Well, she was working with my dad um so that has just come to an end as far as the income from that Um, i'm in real estate i've been in real estate the last five years and so she works in real estate with me but she's just getting started with that um so she should have some income you know over the next 12 months um you know maybe between 30 and fifty thousand is what i would expect so she's in her in her 50s as well for her she's she's 57 as well okay so he, he he always managed the money just from the beginning. They were married 37 years. Um, we've been together a long time. And so this is all really new for her. So we've met with a couple of financial, financial advisors. And, um, you know, I, just, I feel like it's so volatile that I don't want to, you know, encourage her to do something where she might lose 10 or 20% with, with the market the way it is. I feel like her mortgage is almost too much to put all, you know, just to pay off the mortgage. I, I don't want to put her in a bad spot. With cash flow, but if she has honestly, zero payments in you. the world, it doesn't put her in a bad spot. That that, that is true. It doesn't take much live when you doesn't take much live when you don't have any payments. Right. So, what do you make a year? Uh, I made four hundred last year. I probably won't make that this year, but probably yeah. two two fifty. Okay. You know, I, here's what I would do. Um, Roger, you chime in anytime. The, um, I want you two to go through Financial Peace University together because it sounds like it's time for her now to learn how to handle money. She needs the okay. conf- she needs the tools and the confidence that that competence will give her, and you go just mm-hmm. as moral support, okay? And I'll okay. pay for it. I'm going to give okay. it to her, all right? We're going we're to put you on hold to sign her up for Financial Peace, um, number one. Number two, in while she's doing that, I would pay off the house. That's going to leave her a hundred hundred thousand and some change. I'm going to set a portion of that aside as the emergency fund, and I'm going to sit down with a smart investor pro, and I'm going to invest the rest. It's not much, but I'm going to invest the rest. Here's what I'm counting on. I'm counting on her being able to eat because she starts selling houses. And that gives her plenty of money with no payments to exist. Mm-hmm. If that is an absolute debacle and doesn't happen, while she's getting a different job, you make $200,000 a year, it won't take much to feed her mm-hmm. if she has no payments. 
That's what I would do. Okay. And uh, I mean, you're making a couple. Of, you're making quarter mail. If she makes nothing, and you you know you pay a few of her bills here or there to help her turn the corner, and, and because she doesn't make it in real estate, and she goes on to something else, but she can get a job and survive, and and mm-hmm. prosper. At 57 years old, she's got a lot of life in front of her and no payments in the world. And the peace in this time of grief that that paid-for house will give and the peace that that paid-for house will give her while she's out trying to sell real estate, it takes some of the desperation out of her voice when she's talking to somebody about the kitchen. Mm-hmm. She got a lot on her. She got a lot on her. I'm trying to take some of it off. Yeah, yeah and I would encourage her to, yeah. Josh, not to do anything major for 12 months. I mean, obviously paying off the house is a big, is a big part of it, but, um, as, as little change as possible that can happen for just her grieving process. And you guys as a family walking through it, I think is really, is really important. Um, but yeah, giving her the ability to know that she has control now over her money because, um, we see it, we see that story so often, right? That, the dad takes care of the mom financially. She kind of knows some of it, but like he, he does the nuts and bolts. Or um, vice versa. Or vice versa, yes. And then when that spouse, something happens, um, that other person, it, they, they don't have the confidence. And so in that, that fear can be paralyzing. So giving her the ability to know that she can make on the monthly budget, knowing that she knows and understands the investing world, you know, to a high level that she knows where she's putting her money and she's being smart about it, and she knows she has a plan for retirement, like all these things um, that you look at in your financial life, as much of that that she can start to understand and plan for herself will give her peace because all the all the question marks cause stress and fear. Um, and as many of those questions that can be answered for her, which I think Financial Peace University does a fabulous job walking through so much of this big stuff. Yeah. Um, but Josh, you're a kind, you're a good, you're a good kind man. man. You're a good man, you're a good son. Um, I, and just for those of you that listen to the show all the time, we generally tell people after the passing of a spouse, try to make no major decisions for at least six months, maybe even up to a year. So take the insurance money, park it in a CD, nothing fancy, and just sit and cry for a while. And let your brain clear of the waves of grief before you start making major decisions. By the fact that she has now chosen a career and gone out there after six months, and by the fact that she's meeting with financial advisors and they are telling her to invest the money, um, and he's considering that, that's what took me to the, all, all the way to paying off the house pretty mm. quick. Because, um, you know, she's, she is, has moved into the next stages. There's proactive. And she's, yeah. she's proactively moving past. And so, you know, if, if she was still sitting there trying to figure out what she was doing and I heard paralysis or I heard grief was still holding her right now, I would have just said park the money a little while longer, mm-hmm. but not invest it. Yes. So that and very rarely on the show do we say to uh, reach out and take care of family members in right. an because ena- most of the time it's enabling situations. Right. The calls on here. But I don't think he's going to have to. No, no. Well, no. And it's not an enabling situation. Like if if a worst case scenario comes, like what you said, she's she's starting this new career path in real estate and it's not working, but her, but him helping her. There is a level of this generosity piece of the message of, of when you do well with your money, right? When you handle it well mm-hmm. and you're smart with it, there's a generosity piece that doesn't have to be an enabling piece right. to people in your life that you love. Right. Well, the point being, when, when I pay off the house and it leaves just a t- yeah. hundred thousand bucks left, okay, immediately what starts going through his and her mind is, how am I going to pay my bills if this doesn't work? Well, number one, you don't have to sell a lot of houses to make a living when you don't have any debt. Yep. It doesn't take a lot. So she, she just plinks one ever so often. She's going to be okay. She's very unlikely to fail to that degree. Mm-hmm. Right. But worst case then, I'm all the way right, back to right, right. she's got this backstop yes. of a son that's very prosperous. And as a temporary measure, mm-hmm. a sustainability measure, not an enabling measure. So, you know, because that's what goes through your head when I take a big most of your cash and not pay off your house with it then you go oh god how am i going to eat then if this doesn't work out well you got to think it through number one it doesn't take many houses she's got to sell number two she's going to get another job if that doesn't work number three she's got the backstop of the prosperous son so it's a te- all those are temporary things and very very unlikely that she ever gets to any of them probably what's going to happen is this lady's going to step into her stride and be a world-class real estate agent and it's the next stage of her life 
the encore, the bow after the curtain call, and um, the song you play after the everybody thought you were done, you know, and it's, that's what she's going to do. And it, it's going to be a big deal, and she's going to have a great life, and it's going to turn out okay in a really tragic and sad situation. This is The Ramsey Show. time you hear someone here on the air do their debt-free scream it's because at some point they said i've had it enough enough i'm not living like this anymore and when you get mad like that and do what they did your life will change right now inflation stupid credit cards man it's everywhere stuff's killing you you got to start to believe that you're not you can start to believe you're not in control with your money but the fact is you are in control and you can control it. And you can control the thing that controls it, and that's you. The person in your mirror is your solution and your problem. You go to Financial Peace University, we're going to show you how to change your life and change your future. We've done that with this proven step-by-step -step plan for nearly 10 million people, helping them get out of debt, get on a budget, build wealth, be outrageously generous, Learn to work with their spouse about money. Guys, stop letting debt and money stress control your life. Say enough and take back control. Start Financial Peace University at RamseySolutions.com slash enough. RamseySolutions.com slash enough. Jordan's in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hi, Jordan. How are you? I'm doing very well, Mr. Danzy and Mrs. Cruz. How are you guys doing? Great. How can we help? Um, so my wife and I had gotten out of debt about two years ago, paid off $53,000 in 19 months. And now we have a net worth of about 120. Uh, the only thing that's still sticking around from back when we were in debt is our credit scores. And because we don't have any active debts or active accounts, they're just going down and it's creating issues for us purchasing a home. When did you pay off the last debt? It would be 23 months ago. Something's wrong. Never seen it take 23 yeah, months for your credit score to disappear. It usually disappears long before that. You've got an open account somewhere. That's what I thought, too, until I went through each of the three bureaus, opened up all my accounts. They all say paid and closed, and I've even called each of the three bureaus. Hmm. Do you own a home now? No, sir. We're renting. Is your landlord reporting? Uh, believe, well, no, there shouldn't be any debt because we actually got a deal by paying 12 months in advance. But are they reporting to the credit bureau? Do you know? You're not seeing it on there, right? No, sir. Man, I was shocked because uh, usually this is, there's still a bad debt lingering out there or an open account. You just didn't, didn't get it closed. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's still showing up that it's very unusual for it to go 23 months and not disappear. Matter of fact, I've never heard of it before. Um, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm just, I, it's making me scratch my head. But so, you're, but you're continuing to see it, Jordan, go down get worse and worse. Like every time you That's check correct. it. How, yeah, so, how often is it dropping? Um, I use credit karma. So I, I probably open it once a month just to see if I'm down to nothing, but it's probably once a month. It'll go down a couple of points. Just a couple of points. Yeah, like the graph looks pretty linear, two or three points a month. Yeah, it ought to be dropping, dropping like yeah. 50 points a it's month. It's usually on average around 18 months, Jordan, so yeah. I would be... Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if... I wonder, is there something I should be saying to the credit bureaus when I call them to ask them about it? Yeah, um, 
<laughs> ask them since you have no accounts open why it's not disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, I've never heard of this before. I'm not saying it can't happen, or maybe they haven't, because they don't publish their algorithms. They don't tell us anything. I was about to say, all, I wonder. The only way we know anything is just observing what you guys are all doing out there. And so mm-hmm. we're just not running into this. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I would want to know why that is happening, and I don't know why right now. I don't. I don't know how to help mm-hmm. you, but yeah, your goal is for that stinking thing to disappear. What's it down to? Uh, believe it was. I checked today. Five thirty-eight was what it was. It can't get much lower than that without disappearing. That's about mm-hmm. it. So yeah. maybe maybe another month or two it'll be gone. I, that's my hope. Since I don't know the answer to your question, I'm sorry, but I. I do know that um, that this, you know, usually six to 18 months, it disappears from the date of last activity and 100% of the accounts have been dealt with and are closed. Now, if you've got an old bad debt, not you, Jordan, because you don't, you've been very diligent and very careful. Yeah. But if you're listening to us, you got a, an old bad debt from 1972 hanging out there and it's just still sitting there. It'll stay there forever. I well, mean, and, you, and that's an important point at least to make Jordan or that that you're making in this that all of you on track of paying off debt as you pay off debt the the mathematical equation of how your credit score is calculated is based on you being in debt and paying on your debt on time but when you stop accruing new debts when there's no new types of debt that's happening and you're paying it off you you are going to see your credit score drop so some people do freak out because like oh my gosh my credit score and the only reason that really is a bit is a factor is when you're going to buy a home and the goal which is not happening with jordan right this moment but the goal is for it to become under like it's it's undetermined you can't you they, there's no factors to calculate the credit score then you can do manual underwriting to get a mortgage um so you can't get a mortgage while you're on baby step two as you're paying off this debt your credit score is not going to be good but we don't encourage you to get a to, house anyway then. that's right that's right yeah. so jordan i'm hoping to, yeah in the next Gosh. Yeah, I hope it, hope it wraps up for you. Three, four but months. If not, I, I would keep calling. You know, I'm going to keep pestering people and try to find the answer to the yeah. riddle if I'm you, but I don't know the answer to your riddle. So I appreciate you pestering us, though. We're That's what we're here for. <laughs> Zach is in Charlotte, North Carolina. Hey, Zach, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Great. What's up? Hey, I was listening to your show actually this morning from yesterday, and I had a question stop me in my track. Um, lady paid off dead free scream and uh, her she had a house that really prompted her to get into it um, like a flood or something and so I'll tell you my story I'm about 18 months into baby step two I have about a year left and twenty five thousand dollars left on that and I own a home and I'm trying to determine if I should sell that home because I'm in baby step two not like do you like do you like the home I do yes okay how much is your house payment uh, my house payment's 800 a month. Here's the kicker, though. Uh, it's a duplex. It was built as a duplex, and I have a renter that pays me more than that. For okay. And what's your household around. income? I bring in about 65000 a year. Okay. So no, you, Zach. You, I, go ahead. No, you don't need, I don't think you need to sell it. No. You're you going to be out of debt in a year, okay. so no. I mean, some oh. now some people choose – to go radical and some people listening are crazy and like would live in a tent to get out of debt as as possible. But we don't, we don't recommend you selling your house to get out of consumer debt. Now, if your house payment is insane and a high percentage of your monthly take home pay, then yeah, you want to look at the calculation because we want to get you out of debt as fast as possible. And you may be house poor. If you're going to sell it anyway, because you hate it. Yeah. You know, then go ahead and sell it, and that just accelerates the process. But if it's a house you want to keep five years from today, you plan to still be there. Three years from today, you still plan to be there. Then, yeah, pay it off and hold it. That's what I would do. Uh, Every every single time is not required that you sell a house. You know, no, no, it's not. But, um, you know, some people do it out of convenience. Some people do it out of zest and excitement and gazelle intensity. Um, but most of the time, we tell people to somebody sell houses if they were going to sell it anyway because they don't like it. And if um, – or if the house payment's too high. If the house is the problem mm-hmm. and you're a house it's 50% poor, of your income. That kind of It's crap. hard to yeah, get traction. Yeah. That puts you in a mess. So then, yeah, we would dump a house. But house is the most expensive – thing that we own to sell selling some mutual funds no big deal 
selling a car. A little bit bigger deal, but still not that big a deal. Uh, you can get another car. I mean, but but when you sell a house, you have to move. Moving's a pain in the butt. When you sell a house, it takes up a bunch of your emotional bandwidth, a bunch of your time, because you have to change your dresses on every stinking thing. You selling a house and moving is a you know, it takes a lot out of you, out of your family, out of everything else. Um, it's not as easy a transaction as, yeah. as most other things. So we, it's the last thing I do is tell you to sell the house. And in your case, no, I wouldn't sell it. That simple. It puts this hour of the Ramsey Show in the books. Our thanks to James Childs, our producer, Andrew, Zach, Ben, Austin, all in the booth making this show happen. I am Dave Ramsey. We'll be back with you. Hey, it's Rachel Cruz, co-host on The Ramsey Show. If you want to do your debt-free scream live on the show, visit RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream. We'd love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story. That's RamseySolutions.com slash debt-free scream. Solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. We help people build wealth, do work they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Thank you for joining us. Glad you're here. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author. My daughter is my co-host today. Thanks for being here. 888 825 Five. Gina is with us in Tulsa, Oklahoma to start off this hour. Hi, Gina. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. What's up? So I am actually being sued by a payday lender, and I would like to know how to go about dealing with this. Wow. Life must be rough. <laughs> yes, a little bit. I mean, number one, you went into a payday lender, and then number two, you didn't pay them, and then number three, you didn't pay them for so long that they sued you. You've been struggling a while. Yes, it was in 2016, and yes, I should have paid, and I can't remember exactly why I didn't pay at this point, but yes, now they've contacted me and are trying to sue me. And Oh, they're going to win. Saying, they're going to win. Okay. Yeah, I mean. how, much, how much is it for, Gina? Um, so, uh, the actual loan I took out was for 400 and then it was going to be like 600, um, to pay back. But now they're saying that I owe like, uh, 2,500 for like yeah. court costs or things yeah. like that. Well, and five or six years worth of interest. Yeah. Cause you haven't dealt with this. How old are you? I am 31. How many other things in your life have been unkept for this long? Um, there's that payday loan and, um, I think I have some student loan debt as well. You don't think, you know? Yes, I know. Okay. And have you done anything about it or is it just sitting there since 2016? Um, before the pandemic, I had reached out to them to try to set up payments. And then because of the pandemic and all that, um, I haven't made any payments. When did you graduate? Um, so actually, I didn't end up graduating. I went to dental assisting school back in uh, like 2010. Okay. What do you make now? Um, what do you mean? What do I make? And what is your income? Um, like thirty thousand a year. What do you do? I'm a CNA currently. Okay. Do you have any money? Yes. How much? I um, probably got about four grand in the bank. Good. Call the attorney that's suing and tell okay. them that you're broke and you can't pay them $2,500, but you'd be happy to pay them the 600 or even 1000 to settle this because it's such an old debt and begin to negotiate and argue with, and you will find the person on the other end of the phone to be a complete twerp. But that's just part of the process. 
This okay. is not. This yeah. is going to be unpleasant, but it's going to be less unpleasant than losing a lawsuit and having them garnish your wages. Yes, and I've already uh, tried contacting them via email, and they wanted uh, like my copy of my pay stub. No, 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 no. They get no information. I'll give you a thousand dollars cash settlement in full. Well, I'm not giving you squat. Kiss my butt. This is how the negotiation sounds. Okay. okay? No, you can't have anything. You, but you need to get on the phone with them. Okay, so it's better to call, not email. Yeah, yeah, and just argue okay. with them. And if you get any, if they are going to settle, you need that in writing before you send them money yes. as and well. And then, then when you do come to agreement and they go, okay, we'll do $1,100 or whatever it is you end up, $900, whatever it is you end up agreeing for, okay? Then say, I need that in an email in writing and I will immediately wire you the money. So two rules here. Number three rules for you. Number one, deal with this. Yes. You've been sticking your head in the sand long enough. Deal with it because it's not going to get anything but worse. Same thing with the student loans. Deal with it. Number two, get it in writing. Okay. It didn't happen if it's not in writing. It's a lie. They lie. Okay. Okay. And they don't mind lying to you because they consider you a liar since 2016. Okay. So get it in writing. Number three, no electronic access to your checking account under any circumstances. They're going to say, oh, just give us your account number and we'll clean out your account is what they're going to do. Then you won't have the money for rent. Okay. So, no, I will wire you the money or I can send you a prepaid debit card with that amount on it. Or something like that. But no electronic access to your checking account and no personal information. Do not give them any more information. They, okay. get, they, they have a phone number on you and you can block that if you need to. But don't tell them where you live. Don't tell them anything. Because they're going to use all of that as leverage to garnish your butt if you don't get this settled. Okay. And But deal with this. Gina, there's a pattern with you. And you've got to break that pattern, okay, for your yes, own sir. good, for your own good. This stuff does not get better by, by ignoring it. Do you understand and do you agree? Yes, I understand and I agree. Good. Okay. Because uh, you, you get these things behind you, you got a bright, wonderful future. But not dealing with things since 2016 is um, it's a problem. And then you use language like, I think I have a, no, you know you have a student loan. This all indicates well, where your headspace is on this. It's that and the, the proactiveness, Gina, which obviously we can't do for you or change your heart in this or your energy behind it. Um, but when I hear people, you know, use that language, even it's like she knows it's there. She probably doesn't know really how much specifically no, yeah, the interest that's occurred. When does it, like, like it's, it's just, it's kind of all over the place. And denial is not just a river in Egypt though. I mean, that's really, it's, it's not, it's, it's something that it, it's something that people actually do. I can't. And I so, can't. <laughs> so yeah. How, you, how do you spell that? You've got to, you have to, you have to push this through. Okay. <laughs> and so the number one habit of highly effective people in Stephen Covey's book, the seven habits of highly effective people is they're proactive. Mm -hmm. They happen to things. Things don't happen to them. When you have a situation where there is conflict and you do not get closure on it, whether it's financial conflict, legal conflict, whether it's a uh, relational conflict, whatever it is, and you don't get closure on it, it does not get better. It gets worse yeah. 100% of the time. It gets worse until there's closure. It just continues to grow and grow and grow and grow and get worse and worse and worse and worse. It's a problem. So there you go. Open phones at 888 825 -5225. How many times have you found yourself saying one day, one day, one day we'll do this? Well, your one day is here. It's called the One Day Smart Conference. We're going to work with you on marriage, on mental health. We're going to work with you on success principles and leadership. We're going to work with you on becoming a Baby Steps millionaire, world-class speakers, thought leaders, best-selling authors. Rachel Cruz, Dr. John Deloney, Craig and Amy Groeschel will be speaking on marriage. It's all day long, October the 22nd. There's just a few passes left at $39 for general admission. Dallas, Texas, October 22nd, the Smart Conference. You don't want to miss it, and it's almost sold out. Get her done. This is The Ramsey Show.
If you're looking for ways to update your home without blowing the budget, I've got it. For years, I've been telling you about our friends at Blinds.com. Blinds.com makes it simple to shop top quality blinds, shades, and interior shutters from home with easy online ordering and free shipping. With Blinds.com, there's no need to renovate your entire home. Just change out what's on your windows with upscale choices like faux wood blinds, cellular, and roller shades shades or even outdoor shades. Plus, Blinds.com guarantees the perfect fit, whether you do it yourself or you have them measure and install everything for you. Shop their latest looks and see how much you can save at Blinds.com today. The easy and affordable way to make your home more beautiful is Blinds.com. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Our question of the day comes from Blinds.com. They're the number one online retailer of custom window coverings with free samples, free shipping, new promos all the time. You'll save even more. Use the promo code RAMSEY to get the best possible deal. So today's question comes from Holly in Tennessee. My brother and sister-in-law asked my husband and I if we would take care of their four children in the event of their passing. To me, there is no higher honor. We have agreed, but I'm worried that I do not have that, that I do not know the right questions to ask about this potential situation. What should I be asking for besides a copy of their will? We want to be as prepared as if this would ever if this were to ever happen. Hmm. It's a good one. Yeah, it's very good. The that whole process is a is a fascinating one to have to pick to say okay, you know, because when you do your will, that's that's a big part if you're a parent of of where they're going to go. So, yeah, for me, I mean, I would want to know, you know, the the financial side in a mm-hmm. sense of uh, yeah. what their expectations are. Who's going to be handling the money? Who's handling the money? When do the kids? get a say in it, you know, cause you can put ages 18, 21. Do you, are they going to stagger it to know? I would want to know their plan from the financial, po- from the financial side. Mm-hmm. Um, but, and then obviously the, the moral side, you know, of, of raising these children that are not yours and, you know, having that conversation of mm-hmm. what that looks like, watching their parenting style, doing as much as possible, not to copy who they are by any means, but um, to be able to put into place, you know, different things, but that's obviously when, when or if that ever happens. But from the financial side, yeah, I would, I would ask, I would ask some questions for sure. I think it's good to have a copy of the will and it's good to have a clear discussion on uh, if there's any, uh, uh, is there any life insurance proceeds or any other things that are going to be left to take care of these kids? Or are you expecting us to feed them? Um, What's what's our, what's our responsibility that we just took on here? And, um, well, the, you know, we're going to leave it all into a trust and the trustee's going to be Bob. Okay, good. That's, I need to know that. And so, and how much is left in the trust? I don't need any of it, but I'm just worried, wanting to make sure I'm able to do what I'm supposed to do here. And then I would have them write out a letter on, uh, what their wishes were as far as parenting goes, mm-hmm. you know? And so, you know, like in our family, it would have said something like, um, Make sure you keep them in a good local church, stay plugged in, you know, and that their spiritual walk is developed uh, mm-hmm. and so forth. Um, and, you know, we, we did have a lot of things like that tied into when you all were minors uh, into, the, uh, into the estate plan at the time. So, but, yeah, that's very good that they are that thorough uh, to even know who to ask. And the fact that they're doing a will, that's amazing. A lot of people don't even bother to do that. Mm-hmm. which is horrible. You people need to get your will done out there. Um, but then you guys, what Holly's doing here is just really outstanding. Is thinking yeah. about, okay, what does this really mean? And, um, you know, that's, that, that's so much that, that, that means that they picked the right lady, mm-hmm. you know, pick the right person. That's good. David is with us. David is in South Bend, Indiana. Hi, David. How are you? 
I'm doing great. How are you and Rachel doing? Better than we deserve. What's up? So, uh, Dave, I just wanted to first uh, thank you uh, because of your teachings, and we followed it. Uh, we will be, and me and my wife and I will be entering Baby Step Four for 2023. Yay! Um, so my, so my question is, uh, two small questions. Uh, so I'm not really good when it comes to the whole, uh, you know, where to invest uh, for my 401k plan. So uh, previous employers I had only offered the pre-tax before. Um, so now I started a new employer in April, and they have three options: it's a pre-tax, a Roth, and an after-tax. Uh, so my first question is, uh, where should I put my 15% based on those three? Roth. And then my second question is, uh, since we still are paying on the house, um, how much percent of our income should we put towards fund money? Good for you. Roth. Uh, Roth grows tax-free. The best thing you can do is get a match. The next best thing you can do is tax-free. And the next best thing you can do is traditional. And so you've got yeah, Roth, have, um, you've got they, Roth they available. Match, oh. I'm sorry? Yeah, they match a full on the on the first percent, and then I think it was fifty on the two through six. Yeah, great so match. Now the matching portion will not be Roth; it will be traditional by law. It has to be okay. Uh, but the rest of it is Roth, and do it all in Roth. As far as the money that is left over after you've done that in your budget, how much goes towards paying off the house early, and how much goes towards fun? Uh, if you do zero of one or the other, you're doing it wrong. So zero towards the house because it's all fun? No. All towards the house and no fun makes Jack a dull boy. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> makes what? <laughs> it's an old nursery rhyme. <laughs> this is why I have you on the show. I so you learn these important. Like, this is the, this is the hour Jack of important adult, sayings Jack, that say you it, never say heard. Say it slowly. I'm not kidding. Say it slowly. Jack is a dull boy. Jack is Jack a dull makes boy. Jack, no fun makes give, Jack a give dull us boy. The, give us All the wrong. All work and no play gonna, makes we're, Jack we're, a dull boy. David, we're good. All work and no play makes All Jack a dull boy. All work and no Sorry, play David, makes yes, Jack but a dull boy. It's both. Yeah. And David, you know, when it comes to paying off the house, I think it's always a fun exercise just to map out and say, okay, what if we paid it off in seven years? How much, how much would we have to spend? What's to, that take? Yes. Yeah, yeah. How much would we have to put towards the mortgage to make that? Let's do 10 years. Let's do four years. And you can kind of see and know your over, your overall budget for your household and say, okay, well, what's realistic that it, we don't, we're don't we not completely burned out, uh, but we are being aggressive towards something that most people just sit around and wait. Are y'all laughing at me? Is everyone still laughing at me? No, I'm, I'm, I'm not. They are in the booth. They are in the booth, at they are in the booth but I'm not. <laughs> Y'all are unbelievable. It's all dudes now in the booth. Everyone listening doesn't care, but Kelly used to be, I used to, there was, used to be yeah, some Yeah, Ke like women. Kelly took up for anybody. I mean, <laughs> Kelly didn't take up for nobody but Kelly. <laughs> well, so. And me. Now I'm, it's me yeah. against the world. Oh, bless you. <laughs> Get me the world's smallest fiddle out. Okay, open phones at 888-825-5225. Skylar is with us in Illinois. Hey, Skylar, what's up? Hey, Dave, this is... Uh Great to talk to you. You too. How can we help? Uh, so I have a question on upgrading a home. Um, we currently own a home, uh, have a mortgage on it, and we're uh, looking to make, get a bigger house. Mm -hmm. um, we're currently uh, debt-free um, other than the mortgage. Mm -hmm. um, and I make, I make about $74,000 a year. My wife is a stay-at-home mom. We have an eight-month-old. Currently, and then we have another baby on the way in February. Yay! Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. So your question so, is what? So, so uh, I just want to know, is it good? Should, should we pause investing 15% or cut back on that right now to start stockpiling uh, for a down payment on a bigger house? What's your house worth? Uh, it's currently worth uh, 120000 And your mortgage on it is what? Uh, Seventy-five. You already have a down payment. Okay. When you okay. sell, when you sell that. No, I mean, if you want to save more for a down payment, I would not. I would do that, but I would not stop investing to do that. Okay. So, gotcha. You know, what what price range home do you think you might be moving to? Uh, probably somewhere in the two hundred thousand dollar range. Okay. Well, fifty thousand dollars is twenty five percent down. Okay. Right. Correct. So you don't have PMI if you do this, and that's a good move. So you can make okay. that move as long as your house payment is no more than a fourth of your take-home pay. 
on a 15-year fix, you can make that move now. Okay. Because you got enough to put down when you sell your house. Is that making sense? Yes, I guess. Yeah. Uh, if you want to save up I some don't. more down, that's okay, too. There's no harm in that. But it, sure. it does not require that you you don't have a lot of margin, a lot of wiggle room in your budget, but it doesn't require you stop your 15%. You've just started saving. You've just started investing. I hate to turn it right back off. I mean, you're Keep just now getting the ball rolling. Yeah. And I want you to lose that momentum. Open phones this hour, 888 825 This is The Ramsey Show. real estate and I want you to have a house but I don't want a house to have you that's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right these guys are awesome they'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you that means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan they show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership, and Churchill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey, to start your approval or get more information. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author. My daughter is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Zach is with us in Sarasota, Florida. Hi, Zach. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dean, Rachel. How are you? Great. What's up? Uh, my sister wants to borrow um, about $5,000 from my wife and I about... Um, uh, getting paying bills and, and just getting through life, but she has no uh, budget, no, nothing like that, that that you preach about. And we're just trying to figure out how to approach the situation without causing a rift and go about it. Hmm. Well, it doesn't sound promising that this $5,000 is really going to help her. Would you agree? Uh, yeah, yeah, it wouldn't. No, it yeah. would, it'd be more. Yep. Later on, and it's more for legal things and house and rents going up, as you know, with everything. And legal it, things. It was, what are her, legal things? Um, divorces. She's going through a divorce. Yes, sir. So she wants you to pay her attorney bill. Pretty much. Okay. Why is she going through a divorce? And it's just a rough divorce and rough uh, marriage and getting through everything. And she, it's just not right for her. She tried to amend everything and it, it wouldn't be. It, it's past it. Mm -hmm. And you feel like though she has a pattern in her life where you yes. don't trust the, yeah. So you, so you're, Correct. you're calling us, but you know, in your heart. Probably not, probably not going to happen, but you're wondering, like, how to even communicate that or correct. how can we best help? Okay. How, much, how much money do you guys have? Oh, we're debt-free. How much money do you have? 
Um, five hundred thousand dollars. Yes, sir. Okay. And how much do you have, like, in uh, savings and checking and so forth? That you get your hands on uh, about three hundred thousand. Okay. That's going towards our home. That's that's already invested money into our primary homestead home in Florida. I'm sorry. Is that cash in a checking account or savings account, or you've already paid bought yes, the house? Yeah, that's that's no, that's we're we're building right now. Oh, you're and building, and the money of, is for your we're home. We're building a home. I got you. Okay. Correct. So this money's yes, earmarked correct. for your home, but five thousand dollars won't mean you don't get into the home if you use five thousand dollars. So five thousand dollars in correct. your life isn't as big a deal as it is in her life. Well, so here's yeah. the thing. Um, no, I would not. I would never, under any circumstances, loan anyone money, particularly people I love, because it changes yeah. the nature of the relationship to borrow or slave to the lender. The odd thing is, she will end up resenting you for this later, because she will feel like a slave, yeah. and she won't even know why. It's just weird. And so, yeah, uh, so, but what I would be willing to do is to give it to her under certain circumstances. If I am participating in her healing and moving towards sustainability, fine. If I'm participating in chaos, which is what her life appears to be, yes. if I'm participating in irresponsibility, disorganization, and no plan whatsoever to change that, then I'm just giving a drunk a drink. I'm an enabler. That's really not an act of love then. You're right. Yeah, if you love me, you would give me the money and not require me to change. No, the fact that I'm requiring you to change as part of the gift is because I love you. As a matter of fact, it's the only act of love in the whole process. So, does she live in your town? Yes. Okay. She does. Um, recommend you and your wife sit down with her and have a cup of coffee. And your wife doesn't need to say anything because she'll end up being the bad guy, not because she's her opinion is not valid, but because I don't want her to be the bad guy. This is your sister, okay? But your wife well, needs to be there. My, my wife. I'm sorry. Go ahead. She asked my wife for the money first, and then my wife told me about it. Yeah. But she went to her first. Yeah. That doesn't matter. You sit down with the two of you, so you show a unified front, and you say, listen, here's well, you got a lot of pain in your life. I'm sorry for what's going on. I want to be a help to you. We will not loan you the money, but I will give you the money under these circumstances. You're going to go through Financial Peace University. You're going to get on a budget. You're not going to borrow any more money. You're going to get and keep a job, and you're going to get in a position to pay your bills and be a responsible adult for the rest of your freaking life. And this is your brother talking to you because I love you. Okay. It, and she's likely going to say, no, thank you. Or she's going to say, yes, okay, I can do that. And in her heart of hearts, probably wants to, because everything you just listed out sounds good. And then when you get in the middle of it, or you start it, and it, and then it, and then it goes off. So that's my thing a little bit about the strings attached with the money. Like, I totally understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But also, he, he can't make her do those things. So if you go about that, which I'm not saying is, is wrong, because it what Dave just said, but also, Zach, like, you have to emotionally let go that you you can't force her to do anything. You can suggest and and but yeah. you're going to give her the money. I'm not going to give her the money up front I'm and, until the, she does some I'm gonna, things. She's going to I'm going to see some action. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. Does That's she fair. work? Uh yes, she okay. works for herself. She's self-employed. Does she make any money? Does she have kids too? Sorry. Sorry. Yes, there are, there are children involved. Mm, man. Okay. Uh, she makes money, yes, but it's all going towards bills and everyday living expenses, rent. Food, Does she fuel, make enough to support like the household after she's divorced if you help her with $5,000? No. no. Okay, so she doesn't make any money. Correct. She There's needs nothing saved. Com compared to her lifestyle, yeah. no, too. She needs a job. And to okay. maybe move. I mean, like, seriously, the if your lifestyle's at a certain yeah. point. If this was not your sister and you sat down and just looked at the math and told her what to do with the math, that's what you need to tell her to do. Yes. 
Yeah, I got to get your income up. I got to get your outgo down. That means you probably can't live in this house. It's too expensive, or you can't uh, continue to work this uh, crummy small business idea that is not really making you any money, and it's, yeah. it's an excuse for you to not work really. And so you've got to go with like nine to five, and the kids are going to be in daycare, and I'm going to help you with all that. We're going to coach you. We're going to be your yeah. biggest cheerleaders, and we're going to walk alongside you. And uh, and I need the money for an attorney. Okay, I'm going to pay the attorney directly. I'm not giving you the money. And uh, and I'm going to be on the phone with the attorney. I want to know what's going on uh, for the $5,000 I'm giving or the $3,000 retainer I'm giving him. The yeah. $2,000 is going to these bills. Okay, I'm going to write the check to those bills directly. When the Ramsey Family Foundation comes into someone's life who's having financial trouble, we pay the bills directly. We do not give them a check. Zach, do you think if you sat down with her, because I don't know what Joel's relationship is, obviously, never met, but like when you sit down with her <laughs> and say, hey, here's what we see just from a math side, this, this, and this, and after the divorce, here's the rent, like, like, not, like this isn't going to work mathematically. So we're here to help problem solve, to figure out how to get your life stable uh, where you can breathe again. And if you give suggestions, is she the type that, wa- will she want to hear it? Does she want help, but she just doesn't have anyone in her life to walk beside her or th- not? It, it just depends on, on how she feels at that time. Yeah. Sometimes she just wants the money and sometimes she doesn't want to hear anything but the money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, well, the, yes or no. And the answer no to that question is it. no. If all you want is money and you don't want any help, real help, no, yeah. I have no, I have no desire to participate in your crazy. I'm not, I'm not funding it for you. When you decide you want to get things straightened up, I'll walk with you mm-hmm. in a process to help you get things straightened up. We'll pay for you to go through Financial Peace University and we'll give you the money, but don't loan her money. Loaning her money means you expect for it to be paid back and it changes the quality and the tenor of your relationship and I would not do that. I would love her well and be very generous and give her money if you're helping her get traction back to sanity and sustainability. But I don't want to participate in crazy and chaos and fund it well. This is The Ramsey Show. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Marita is with us in Syracuse, New York. Hi, Marita. How are you? Hi, Rachel. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Sure. Can you speak directly into your phone? It's pretty muffled. Uh, yes. Is that better? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Thank you. All right. Awesome. Um, so I have a question um, about... Student loans, uh, yay, I have many emotions about what Biden declared today, um, but I'll try and get to the point. Uh, my husband and I were in our early 20s. We have $2,375 left to pay off on our student loans. We have worked so hard to get to this point. Now Biden's declared that he can just forgive it at some point, um, but we know there's a period of time before that's going to happen. Would it be the right thing to do out of principle to just pay it off on our own? Or should we apply for forgiveness once that application becomes available to us? Write a check and pay it off. Don't wait. Okay. <laughs> Don't wait. Um, the emotion here is so is so mixed about the call today and and what they announced, and and I think the heart behind it is relief. Well, we can probably go all around, but I think there's an element of it that is to relieve people. And you guys don't need relief because you have the money. And you got, I mean, and there, and there is a personal responsibility thing with all of this too, that you guys, you know, signed this uh, and your names are on it. And 
uh, the idea of taking money from the government when you have it. I just don't, I can't, I can't, uh, th- that doesn't sit well, doesn't sit well with me. So I wrote a check and pay it off. Don't wait on them. Marie, that's a, Marita, I'm, I'm a nice, I'm a, that's a nice way of saying it. <laughs> Marita, you, um, you already knew that that was what you wanted to do because it's who you are by the way you phrased your question. And so it makes it very easy for us to just agree with you and say, yeah, yeah, I would do that. Um, uh, you know, it, it's not immoral um, for someone to take the relief that is being offered. But there is a, uh, a moral obligation that you borrowed the money. And to pay it back is, not a, it is a values-based decision. Uh, even though you, quote, don't have to, unquote. It's a values-based decision. And, and, you know, so, you know, on a macro level, on a nationwide level, on a uh, big scope, um, somewhere we have to remind people that the money comes uh, from the government comes from somewhere. And the $300 billion with a B, a billion is a thousand million. That is 300,000 million that the president is strutting around proud that he just added to the taxpayer's burden. If you are a taxpayer and 48% of you are not, in America today, a federal income tax taxpayer. But for those of us that are, our burden was just increased by 300,000 million so that you could get $10,000 in debt forgiveness. Um, I'm happy for you if you got your debt forgiveness. Um, I, I really don't want bad things for you. I want good things for you, and I'm not angry with you. You didn't do anything out there if you got debt forgiveness. But... The absurdity of this political move as a Hail Mary to try to get back in the graces of the, good, of the voters before the midterms in a, in, a, in a presidential administration that is a complete economic failure is just infuriating. And it's all put on the backs of your grandchildren because it's all added to the deficit. Three thirty trillion dollars in debt already. And we add 300,000 million to that in student loan forgiveness while we continue to make student loans. And this is just, econ- it's just intellectually dishonest to continue to make the loans and on the one hand and then turn around and forgive them on the next. Because the next call we're going to be getting, the, the, we're going to get this call because it's already running through some of your heads. I've got $26,000 in student loan debt. President Biden just forgave 10. I'm going to wait on him to forgive the rest. Is that okay? even though there's no announcement of that or, or indication of that or promise of that. or, But, you know, once you've opened the spigot, mm-hmm. you, you know, folks are going to con- expect you to continue to open the spigot. Like Trump issued bi- bucks during the Trump dollars during the COVID and then another set and then Biden bucks came out and Biden bucks and Biden bucks. So once the once the, all of your COVID problems were going to be solved by the government instead of by your own hand, then you now are waiting on mm-hmm. these Biden bucks to come through after the Trump bucks, after the Biden bucks, after the Trump bucks. And it just keeps going and going and going and going because you've become begun to look at Washington, D.C. as your source. When we were getting those questions, and we've gotten that question for over a decade. I feel like every politician makes some kind of debt for student loan forgiveness well, and Please, it, you know, like it was that. the fringe. It was Elizabeth Warren and AOC. It was the fringe wackos that were suggesting it at first. And then it got a little bit more mainstream. And this president is so far left, so far much a socialist in his, in his approach to things that, um, you know, he had it on a campaign promise. It took him 18 months in office to come through yeah. with a campaign promise. But the what idea he was is that. During, during the 18 months. But, but also even just the idea of student loan forgiveness that's been floating around for almost yeah. a decade. We've heard that term and because because in, in very small pockets, right, you see different things. Um, 
but and we and we get those calls even then like this is actual facts on paper that it's happening but even just the idea to your points floats in people's heads and when that seed is planted it it's this idea that i'm going to just it, sit back it turns you into a trust fund baby and there's a <sighs> yeah yeah, I mean, if you're sick, if you're if your dad is sixty years old and he's got ten million dollars, and you don't work much, oh. and you want to just sit around and wait on him to die, for you to have a life, because you're going to get in because yeah, you're going to inherit ten million dollars. Yeah, it's mean, the same dad gum thing. I'm I mean, sitting around guess, waiting on I guess, someone I think, else to fix my life. Y- yes, right. The mindset is the same, but I think the feeling of debt and the weight that debt carries on families, though, is different than I just want to be lazy oh. and inherit. Like, do you know what I'm saying? Oh, like, I agree. I agree. So the mind, yeah, That's I get true. what you're saying, but That's also true. I'm like, man, there's like this. But when you when you say, okay, I'm not going to deal with this, right. And I'm going to let someone else. I'm going to. I'm not going to deal with this. I'm yeah. going to. I'm going to wait on someone else to deal with it. And that's not Marita's. And what's question. interesting too, we talk about this all the time on the show of how money, your habits within money, are a lot of different habits in other areas of your life. And so it's fascinating too when if you become passive mm-hmm. with your money, sitting back mm-hmm. and letting other people take it, like. Mm-hmm. Are that, you then that, passive that, in your career? That's right. Are you passive in, in your, your marriage and your, your parent, your like mental what, health, your physical health? Because you're a one health. person. You talk about this a lot. Like you're an in, like integer is a whole number. Mm-hmm. We are to have integrity. You are a whole person. So you can't take one part of your life and say, "I'm going to be like this, this, and this." Wait, right? Like we think we can compartmentalize so much, and we can't. We are one person. Mm-hmm. And so even with that, I mean, I don't, I don't have the science to back it, but I am well, curious. No, I'm, I'm, you, it's impossible it's, to be highly ambitious, organized, and disciplined in your money and uh, be completely opposite of that in every other area of your life. It's, it's, or, be, yeah. <laughs> or be highly ambitious and disciplined in your career, but be completely undisciplined in right. your physical. You know, because just, the opposite it is true. Work. And the opposite is true, which we hear all the time. The people are like, oh my gosh, my spouse and I, like we got out of debt and it changed our marriage because we started communicating. You know, we even hear health, like I lost weight, right? Like all these other things yeah. fall into place. And so- Our marriage even, got better because we yeah, were working on something. Yeah, even a seed planted together. of mm-hmm. being passive in life. It's just hard. I mean, I think it just affects other areas too. So we just, you got to be careful. You got to be careful. Margaret Thatcher said it well. The problem with socialism is eventually you run away, run out of other people's money to give away. It's a problem. It's a real problem. This is The Ramsey Show. Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. Solutions. It's the Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. We help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author. My daughter is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888 825 Anthony's going to start us off in Los Angeles. Hi, Anthony. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi. How are you doing, Mr. Ramsey? Great, man. What's up? Um, so my fiance and I recently got engaged last August, and uh, we've been fighting about the cost of it. I told her that I wanted to pay off my debt first before we went and tried to pay off a big wedding. And I just paid off my debt this month. And uh, with the wedding that she wants, I can't afford it with it only being six months away. And I've been telling her that I don't what, feel What is the price going. tag? 16000 The price tag is 20000 but she we she paid six uh, 4000 so there's 16 left. What do you make? Uh, about 30 40 a year. Okay. What does she make? Uh, about the same, sir. We're both in the military. Oh, I see. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead with your question. Uh, and that's basically, 
So I was telling her that I don't feel comfortable going back in debt. Um, but she basically, I asked her to move it back. She said um, if the wedding doesn't happen when it's scheduled, just like that, there's kind of no reason for us to continue. And I don't know if this is something I should hold my ground on or as a man, if I should make this happen for her. Well, the surface problem is that she's choosing a wedding over you. <laughs> which right. Is like, which oh, you're kind of involved in the wedding. So little, this is kind of oxymoronic. It's a little, it's a little crazy. <laughs> but then the, there's deeper stuff. I mean, I would think, though, Anthony, there's other stuff going on, right? I mean, is it that, that, that I mean, do you have a pattern of not doing what you say? And she feels like that this is part of it. I mean, like, is there is there other stuff or is it really that simple that she's like, if I can't have this wedding at this date with twenty thousand dollars i'm done like is it re- uh, was it really that cut and dry or have you guys been uh we've been fighting uh since we got engaged fighting about what was, about what specifically about, for me it's the cost of it she says that um i'm being greedy and this is something that people you know pay for and i've just been telling her i just don't feel comfortable going in debt there's other ways around it i've said if we can push it back, which we've already pushed it back, it was originally supposed to be uh, happening next month. But due to our finances from coming back overseas, Jeez, we Anna, pushed it. Oh, that's so frustrating. I'm like, go get a ma- go get go go get married. You guys have been engaged for a year. Go get a yeah. marriage certificate. You guys go to the courthouse. Go get married, no, and then don't. in six months. Well, yeah, I guess that's probably true. <laughs> I guess this would have been like this is what I would want for you though if it was in a healthy state. That's fair. That's fair. Is to go do I that, mean, and then you can go do a reception another time. But yeah. there's but there are there are okay. too many red flags here. Let Let's establish a couple things. All right, a sixteen thousand dollar wedding is not too much. You're wrong. That is a reasonably priced wedding and yes sir but you are right to say i'm not willing to borrow money to do it and i don't make a lot of money it's going to take me a while to scratch that together so in in the sense that she's right she probably feels like you don't value her you don't value the ceremony and you're not you know you don't so or he's he's being cheap yeah you're being cheap when it comes to her and that's probably hurting her feelings. And that's probably where the fights are coming from. How old are you two? I'm 23, sir. And she is? 24, sir. Okay. All right. So um, the amount is not out of line. The process and everything around the thing is out of line. When you hear, uh, if I don't get my wedding my way, uh, I'm out of here. Well, guess what? You're going to hear that the rest of your life. If I don't get this car, I'm out of here. If I don't get this couch, I'm out of here. If I don't, if you don't budget for my nails and my hair, I'm out of here. So, you know, you're not an ATM machine. You're a husband, potentially. Okay? And it's not a matter of as a man. It's a matter of we need to be as two grown-ups in, uh, in uh, agreement, in alignment of how we're going to live our lives. And if we can't establish that I'm not going to borrow money. And so if you, if you demand that we do things that require that we borrow money, then we don't need to get married because that's going to be in, inconsistent and we're always going to be fighting. And it's not good. It's going to lead to another divorce or a divorce in the future. So we don't need to do that. But if we can be in agreement that the amount is reasonable, but the process, the ultimatum, I'm out of here if I don't get what I want, spoiled little brat r- routine, um, or the process of, I demand you borrow money to make me happy, um, and again, that's against your values, then, yeah, this is over. She needs to just yes, check out. So uh, so if I were in your shoes, obviously you guys are in love or you think you are. Um, I, I would try to sit down with a pastor, a chaplain. You're in the military. Get a chaplain to sit down with you. Uh, a good Christian chaplain um, is the only way I know to get at it. Um, uh, so... Uh, or go see a pastor at a local church and sit down and try to get some coaching and some counseling, some relational input on how you guys deal with this. It sounds like you're talking at each other instead of with each other. Yes, sir. Like she's not hearing how important this is to you, and you're not hearing how important this is to her. And so it comes down to you have to borrow money to make me happy. That's 
probably not what she really means. I hope she's not that immature and shallow. She's probably just saying, dude, this has been going on forever. <laughs> you know, it's been going on forever. And I don't, I don't see how we're ever going to get there. And I can't, you know, if we don't borrow money, I don't know how we're going to have $16,000. I don't know how we're going to have a decent wedding. But a $16,000 wedding with both of you working and household income would be the equivalent of about 70000 is not unreasonable. Yeah. It's not if you had the cash and can put the cash together. Um, by the way, during this year while you were getting out of debt, she put a whole $4,000 towards this. Where's her? If she makes the same amount of money... Uh, it's not your obligation to man up. I mean, you're over here cleaning up something else. Yeah. So, and I don't necessarily believe you have to be out of debt to be married either, by the way. That's another thing I would throw at you. So we do want you to live out of debt and debt-free because we believe that's the best way you're going to have a great life. But um, it's not, yeah, you're not required to be debt-free to start a family, have a baby or get married, like these big no, life things. But you but do need to be in agreement. Anthony, and right now, the big, the big red flags are you're not in agreement. And if this does come down to the ultimatum of you either borrow money or I'm out of here, then, you know, uh, gonna miss her. Gonna miss you. That's what it comes down to. And she's walking away. Yeah. The old country song. <laughs> Alan Jackson? Is that Band? No, Brad Paisley. No. Oh, uh, no, Brad Paisley is a fishing song. Yeah. I'm, I'm gonna oh, miss, I'm her. miss her too. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot, Anthony. Yeah. This is The Ramsey Show. halfway through august can you believe it next week every store will probably have christmas out <laughs> if fall means uh, that you're planning to go broke until tax season uh make this year the one you say enough is enough you know let's stop say i've had it i make too much money to be this broke the Ramsey $10 sale is back for a very limited time to help you take control of your money. Now's your chance to get up to 83% off our number one best-selling books and tools like the Total Money Makeover, like Love Your Life, Not Theirs, like Know Yourself, Know Your Money by Rachel Cruz. Those are both number one bestsellers. Our team isn't stopping. Get help solving your money worries, and it should not be overwhelming. That's why we're also offering a free financial coaching call with any purchase. Talk with a Ramsey preferred coach about your specific money questions and plans, and they'll help you make goals and stick to them. So you can go from I've had it to I've got this. Ten bucks. Doesn't get much most places, but right now at RamseySolutions.com gets you a lot. The $10 sale. RamseySolutions.com. Check out all the best-selling books that are available for you. Up next is going to be Evan in San Antonio, Texas. Hi, Evan. How are you? Hello, Mr. Ramsey. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can we help? Well, my husband and I were coming up on five years on Friday. Congratulations. Twenty six. <laughs> yeah, thank you. We're still new at this. However, we um, we have been on this journey to getting debt free, but we're stuck on baby step number two because we've had so many transitions. So I wanted to know: Would it be okay for me to take my uh, retirement money that I have to put towards our debt since we're transitioning again? And that way we would be out of the debt, but we would be able to uh, potentially use the rest of our money towards retirement. Well, if you do that, Evan, no. Well, let me say this. No, we would not recommend doing that because if you did that, the amount of penalties, the amount of 
fees that are associated with retirement accounts uh, before the age, you it's it, it's not worth it. It's not smart. Not smart. Do you guys have any other investments that are not tied to retirement? Any other just mutual funds or do you have CDs or anything in any other account? No, ma'am, we don't. We have um, we. So one of our transitions is that we recently moved from another state. So uh, we we had this move because of a job offer that my husband had, and he accepted it. So um, it was a pay increase for him. So However, what's, what's your household had, income? So for household income, right now we're at about seventy thousand. And how much debt do you have working. in Baby Step Two? So in Baby Step Two, we have right around seventeen. And how much money are you putting in your four hundred one k? Um, it's coming out now of his pay because I'm no longer working. Yeah. How much money is going into his 401k? What percentage? I'm not exactly sure. Of okay. And how much, how many times a week do y'all go out to eat? Um, I cook. <laughs> no, no. How many, how many nights a week do you go out to eat? Um, not, not very often. He, how many nights does, a week do you go out to up. eat? Um, I'm not going, we, we don't, I cook every so night. You never go out to eat. Not every night. He grabs something like on the way to work. So he works at I would night. Say, yeah. He works he at works, night. Um, mm -hmm. and then I have the kids. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, mm -hmm. I was teaching, but, um, mm -hmm. I had a baby. Yeah. Good. So I have a newborn, so I'm not. Working. Congratulations. That's awesome. Thank you. And um, Thank you. when was the last vacation you guys had? Oh, my goodness. We haven't had a, a vacation. As a matter of fact, he's working on our anniversary is Friday and he's working. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he, he and may what are the be, transitions um, you're referring to? Having a baby and moving? Uh, no, we had... Um, in 2020, I had um, a baby, a baby boy, and then he had to resign his position at his job. So he wasn't working for a time. He was doing like um, like lift and things like that. But because I was a teacher, I was able to still work during that time. Um, so we were down to one income in 2020 because he wasn't able to work. And then I had the baby. Okay. Let me tell you what I, what so, I hear happening. And you tell me if I'm wrong, okay? okay? A lot of life is coming at you. Job changes, babies, COVID, working, not working. Um, a lot of things are happening, and you've not been paying attention to the details of the money while all these different things were happening because you were your mind was so full of those other things because your answers are incomplete when I ask you very direct questions. Yeah. And so um, I think you kind of feel like a hamster in a wheel, don't you? Yes. Yeah. And you're thinking that the magic bullet is to take, take the money out of retirement. Instead, the magic bullet is to get to the bottom of all of this. And the two of you sit down with the kids in asleep and sit down and do a detailed budget and lay out some dreams on paper, like knocking out this 17000 What have we got to do to do that? And we're going to tighten up the food budget, and we're going to pick up work here and there and do what we can. And we're going to look around here for what we can sell. And we now have a new goal in addition to cleaning diapers and feeding screaming toddlers. We now have a new goal, and that is to knock this 17000 in the head. But the trick is what will happen while you do that is the two of you will learn to work together and work a budget and work a system and happen to the money while life is happening instead of the money kind of gets parked on the side while life is happening and you've got to get up in its face and make it behave right that that that's the answer to your equation and that's a lot more valuable than seventeen thousand dollars and that's a lot more valuable than your retirement account being cleaned out. No, please don't clean out your retirement because this, this debt is a symptom of you guys not having focused concentration, detailed diligence on this subject because of all that's been coming at you. But hey, you got two littles. 
two tiny littles. I've had a lot. And they're like Evan. a full time. That's a big deal. I mean, they're overwhelming. They are. They need a lot. They need a lot. They don't do much for themselves at this age. <laughs> and so, you know, it's, and, Evan, and I and I really do see the next 12 months of your lives uh, getting better, being more simple, right? Like what you just laid out for the last two years, it has been a lot and gaining traction in the middle of all of that. Uh, would be really difficult. And so I wouldn't like, don't feel shame or embarrassment because of that. But also to Dave's point earlier, now that things are settled, you guys actually work on, on your habits and like what you guys are doing, where your money's going, being so, so intentional with a plan, list it out, know exactly what you're doing, have a timeline, have a game plan. And you guys together do that, which from a tactical put, we're standpoint- We're gonna $1,500 a month on this debt. We're gonna be done in a year. Yeah. And we're going to live on beans and rice, rice and beans. We're not going out to eat. We're pausing retirement. Tell them to pause retirement. Gonna, yeah. no. Oh, by the way, you're still putting money into retirement. That's not what we tell you to do. We tell you to stop. I forgot about that. I pulled that out of her and then I left it laying there. It's okay. I'll host the show. Don't okay. You can, you, can, you can catch my slime. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's exactly right. You need to stop your 401k. During, when you're in baby steps one, two, and three, you do not do investing because you need total focus. And you've not had total focus. It's all it's all spread all over the place. That's what we're hearing talking to you. So, yeah, stop your 401K, detailed type budget, beans and rice, rice and beans, no vacations, no eating out. We are going to completely focus on this debt. $1,500 a month, and you are debt-free in one year from today. That's all you got to do. You can do it. This is The Ramsey Show. Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author. My daughter is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Jack is with us in Little Rock, Arkansas. Hi, Jack. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for your time. I appreciate you taking my call. Sure. What's up? So I'm 26. My wife's 27. Uh, in January of this year, we recently became debt-free, including our temporary house. Uh, it's a mobile home we're living in. We're uh, planning to build a home. We have a five-year plan, hoping to save $5,000 a month uh, so that we can build a $300,000 home. Um, now that we're debt-free, we're kind of getting into the investing portion. Um, I'm investing 100 to $300 a week through a cash management uh, account with Fidelity, along with maxing out my Roth through my employer. Uh, what my what portion of was, this is for the house? So the investing is is not for the house. Neither uh, neither one I, of those. No sir, no sir. Um, so the the house we're putting in a savings account, five thousand a month at minimum. Uh, I'm in sales, so sometimes we contribute more than that. Um, but additionally, I'm maxing out my Roth uh, with my employer, and then contributing one to three hundred dollars a week uh, to the S and P five hundred. Uh, but I heard you talking about doing a Roth IRA uh, and didn't know if I was better off doing that. Yes. Uh, I am much, much better, better off. off. Doing yeah. That. At this, so sta at this stage of your wealth building, I would be putting 15% of your income into retirement accounts and in raw and things that have match first things that are Roth second and traditional third until you get to 15%. Okay. What's your household income a year? Uh, I'm about 260. Good for you. Okay. All right. So we're trying to and get to about 50,000 bucks a year going into retirement. Correct. Yes. And, uh, and so you, you, does your wife work outside the home? 
Uh, she did. She was a nurse practitioner, but we recently had twins, so she's now a stay-at-home mother. Okay, oh. cool. Congratulations. Yeah, that's wonderful. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so going to be tough to get to 50,000. Going to be I mean, I you max out your 401k, that's going to be 20, and you max out your uh two Roths, that's going to be another 16. You're not going to still not going to be there. Uh it's only going to be 36. So She's you're not, not working anymore though. I know, you can do a spousal Roth okay. anyway. Um but uh both of you do individual Roths in good growth stock mutual funds. You max out your 401k uh in Roth. That's what I would do. And you know what? At your stage of the game, how old are you guys? I'm 26. She's 27. That doesn't get you to 15%, but that's all you can do without doing after-tax stuff in a cash management type account. Instead, what I would do is build the house sooner. I'd throw everything above the fully funded 401 and the fully funded two Roths. Everything above that I'd throw in the house account. Let's get this house built in three years instead of five. So do I, do I, am I good saving the the money, or do I need to invest the house fund and then pull no, it? No, I wouldn't fool with it. You're fine saving it. Just save it. Yeah, okay. on the house fund. But the other stuff needs to be in mutual funds and in Roths. 401Ks and two Roth individuals. Do that with a good Smart Investor Pro. I mean, you're, you're putting 36000 bucks away that way if I'm doing that right in my head. No, it's, it's, no, it's 32000 But anyway uh for the next three years that's pretty substantial you make a lot of money then you're going to have a paid for house very soon three to four years something like that and um then uh then you can worry about you, you'll be a baby step seven you can worry about other investing at that point but uh you're doing great jack great job well done incredible patrick is in denver hey patrick what's up hey dave hey rachel how are you great how can we help Good. Thanks for taking my call. I'm calling about taking an expensive vacation this time next year to the beach. and want to know if I'm, if I'm too crazy for doing so. A um, little background is me, my wife, and two kids, both under two. We go to the beach for about two weeks. Half the time we spent with my side of the family, half with her side of the family. Uh, the total number of people at any one time would probably be about nine. Uh, these things are hard to plan. So essentially we're going to pay for the house, uh, and invite everyone. Um, people have said that they would contribute, but not, you know, no discussion with regard to how much. Um, and so the budget that we're thinking is it'd be about 20 K for the house for two weeks. Um, and then I'm assuming about three or 5,000 in extra spending, uh, you know, for food, travel, flights, all that sort of stuff. What's your household income? So my wife and I, from a salary perspective, we're about 300 a year. Uh, I'm heavily bonused, um, so all in, we're about 500 to 550 a year. And obviously, you're paying cash for this. Are you debt free? Yep. Uh, everything but the house. Yeah. Uh, so I would do it. About... I would do it. Okay. Yeah, I, that's awesome. with it. That's within your ratios. I mean, it's not crazy. If you told me you made fifty thousand dollars a year, I'd tell you don't do it. Or if I, if you told me you were in debt. <laughs> You had three car payments. I tell you, don't do it. But um, sure. okay. I mean, you make a half million dollars a year. You're dropping twenty grand. Yeah, well, just, our, my, me and my wife are just more conservative. Um, yeah, but I mean, so. if you made a hundred grand and you dropped four grand, it'd be the same thing. Sure, got it. Ratio, uh, what? ratio. Perfect. It's the exact same ratio, right? Yeah, the sticker price is probably getting to you guys, but yeah. but the but the thing to look at really is the percentages of what you guys can afford. So when you see the sticker price, okay. and you're like twenty grand for a house. Oh my gosh, like it feels feels like a lot because it's a lot, but yeah. you guys make a lot. And um, yeah, so generally, <laughs> yeah. As far as anybody else contributing and all that kind of stuff, I I would have zero expectation there. Uh, the secret to happiness is low expectations. <laughs> right. And that's how we're going into it. <laughs> yeah, because if your wife is sitting around waiting on somebody to chip in, then she's going to be pissed at them if they don't. They don't do this, okay? Just don't worry about it. You don't have to. If you, you, you don't need the money. Whatever they don't chip in is good. Whatever they do chip in is good. Whatever. It's all good. Awesome. All right. Sounds Congratulations. Enjoy what the, in the world do the you beach. do for a living? Uh, I'm in private equity. Uh, ah, okay. So. Okay. And what what were you asking, Rachel? I just said, enjoy the beach. Oh, sounds, which beach? Sounds great. <laughs> uh, we will. I'll wear my sunscreen, too. What, what beach are you going to? Uh, it'd be in Florida, um, okay. near uh, Pensacola. Yeah. Okay. Dave and I might show up, Patrick. We may contribute. We may not. 
<laughs> we'll see. Sounds good. Come on down. <laughs> Low expectations of us. I'm not going to say a thing. <laughs> Oh, good luck with all that, Patrick. It's going to work out. Well done, sir. Open phones at 888-825-5225. So ratios are a good way to help you know if the amount is giving you sticker shock or if you're being irresponsible. And uh, here's an example. A friend of mine made uh, $20 million last year. That's what he makes most years, somewhere in that range. He's very, 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 very successful. Makes a lot of money. He bought a um, a two hundred thousand dollar car. That's mind blowing, right? That's a lot. But if you just take some zeros off, let's do it, okay? So instead of twenty million, you made two million. Instead of two hundred thousand, you bought a twenty thousand dollar car. Or ten hundred thousand. Hmm? No, if you made if you went from a hundred two hundred thousand a year. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, from yes. Or you went to a two hundred thousand yes. dollar car yes. to a twenty thousand yes. dollar car. Correct. Correct. Knock a zero off. Correct. Okay, and you knock a zero off the twenty million. And My so, God. if you make two million, is it okay to buy a twenty thousand dollar car? Yeah. If you make two hundred thousand, is it okay to buy a two thousand dollar car? It's the exact same ratios. And if you make twenty thousand. Is it okay to spend two dollars? Yep. So here's the here's the <laughs> kicker, though. So you look at the ratios, which is really really important, but also it gets to the point of like when is the line of like we just don't need it though. Yeah, but the point is it's not a relative amount of money. Yes. It's um you know when someone it, when he's making a half a million dollars. Yes. Spending twenty thousand and again back your ratios down. What's that like for somebody making fifty thousand? That's about like spending 200 bucks. Totally. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. So is that irresponsible? No. Can it shock your mind because it feels like a lot because you've never done it before? Sure. But none of you should stand to the side and go, no one should ever. No, that, that's just you being a judgmental jerk. That's all that is. <laughs> this is The Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Proverbs eleven thirteen. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Eleanor Roosevelt said, "Great minds discuss ideas; average minds discuss events; and small minds discuss people." Rachel Cruz, Ramsey personality, number one best-selling author, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. We're so glad you are here. Mike is with us. Mike is in Oklahoma City. Hey, Mike, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you, sir. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? Well, I have been a Dave Ramsey follower for years, and I've done through, I'm a baby, all the way through baby seven, and would like to be able to start giving back. Um, and I have a heart for trying to help new businesses get started. And I didn't know if you can give me some guidance on what's the best way to set up an organization, whether it's nonprofit, that type of thing to uh, put money into that I can get just give away. Hmm. Generous how, how much are, how much are you talking about? The money to put into you mean? I, I'm, yes. I'm talking maybe where I can give oh like start helping companies, you know, get maybe 15 to 25,000 to help them get started that type of thing. And I'm, I'm looking to put in maybe 250,000 to get started that type of thing. Okay. All right. I think that's probably worthy of going to the legal trouble to form a foundation. Okay, form a found. Okay, sit down with an attorney and have a, and, and talk about how we put together a foundation. And um, we did that several years ago. The Ramsey Family Foundation. It's not for small businesses. It's for ministries that we give to and support and people and so forth. Um, but uh, the same concept. And you would uh, apply for and receive a. Uh, 
you'd want to be a 501c3, a nonprofit, okay. uh, and, and um, it's an IRS process to get that approved. Uh, it takes a little while, six weeks used to. I don't know with them not working much now how that's going to be. But um, the uh, uh, and then you've just got to put together some – you don't have to do this legally, but from a practical standpoint, you just need to think about how you're going to – distribute the money in the most efficient way that causes the most lift, right? Okay, and, right. You know, I, are you plugging in this certain kind of programs? Are you going to have requirements or guidance, guidance, guidelines for what type of small businesses or they have to be healthy in this way and that way and this way before you do it? Or um, are, or is this just straight up startups or? Yes, basically I was looking at startups or ones that have just gotten started. I, I've done one already and I just did it out of my pocket and they now expanded. They have, it's a restaurant now have two stores. And so I, my, I thought, and I'm just, you know, and I've been in church and you run across and you hear different things. And I'm thinking, God, I would like to be able to help out and start this or help them do that. Mm-hmm. And I just, but I've just not been in a position to to start until now. So. Yeah. I mean, you can continue to do it out of your pocket, but if you right. run it through the 501, then um, it's a little more paperwork, a little more structure, but you get a, you get the tax deduction that way. And, okay. uh, and, you know, it's formed for the purpose of this and, um, you know, you know, you'll need to get legal and tax advice on how to put all that together, but it's, it's not, it's not horrendous. It's doable, but it's not worth it. If you're going to give away $10,000 one time, it's not worth the trouble. Um, uh, and, uh, but in this case, I, you know, 250,000 bucks and sounds like you've done very well. Congratulations. Yeah. And so if you're giving out of that to mm-hmm. get the tax benefit, mm-hmm. do you have to give to other 501 C3s? No, no. no. You know, once your foundation is formed for that purpose, mm-hmm. then you're just supporting the, small businesses. You know, then, yeah, the, the fir- that's what the whole purpose of the nonprofit is. And um, but you've got to establish it that way, and it has to all be approved, mm-hmm. of course. Um, then the money that goes into the foundation is tax deductible, not the money that comes out. So um, it's as you put the money in yeah. and take the tax deduction. So when we fund right, the Ramsey the, the Ramsey yeah. Family Foundation, that's a deductible. Process. And I think Mike too, just on a kind of a different point, but I'm like, I would have maybe three or four questions that you just ask yourself to kind of run through. And if there's a no on one of those questions, that it could be a red flag just to give you some, a little bit of parameters too, as you're discussing this. Cause also if this kind of gets out in the world, you, you may get some people knocking on your door being like, Hey, we, we heard you did this over here and we want to start this thing. You know what I mean? So like having a little bit of guidance just for yourself for sanity purposes, I think is important too. Yeah. So we've definitely got, had, had to put that in place and have put that in place in ours so that, um, because we, you know, we're very restrictive on what we do give to, um, very careful. Uh, and yeah, lots of guidelines on it actually. Roger is with us. Roger's in Nashville. Hi, Roger. Welcome to the Ramsey show. Thank you, Dave and Rachel. I appreciate you taking my call. Sure. What's up? Well, I'm recently, I'm 65 years old. My wife will be 60 in December. I'm recently retired and um, I'm at that dilemma of do you take Social Security? And I have a 403B uh, account that has taken quite a hit over the past year or so. And trying to make a decision if I'm supposed to tap into that or just get another job to get me to 66 and a half at the full of the fruition of my Social Security. I have no idea what to do. Yeah. Well, you shouldn't have to. How much is in the 403B? Uh, it's about 175000 Okay. Well, you, you wouldn't have to take out much to, uh, to survive between now and then. But if you want to go ahead and start Social Security, it's okay. Um, but you don't have anything to live on, basically, is what you're saying. I don't, and that's my dilemma. Should I go get another job just to get me to 66 and a half, or should I go ahead and just start taking the Social Security now? Or should you draw down enough on the 175? Because you're not going to draw the whole thing out. No, no, what's it? What's it take you to live a year? Um, well, my income has been about 65000 for me, and my wife is about 38000 But So I'm at zero, so we have her... 38 and so that leaves me should i get another job or tap into both social security and the new and the uh, the retirement account yeah well it, it, if this is all the nest egg that you have it won't hurt to not touch it 
and uh, 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 you know to work a little bit more and, and get yourself through to where you can get the money coming in to live on. That's going to be good. It's not one point seven million. It's one hundred seventy five thousand. Yeah. So yeah, I'm probably going to work in that situation. Um, seems like it's a wise thing to do, and, and then get yourself in a position that that um, you get everything organized, get the house paid off. If it's not, we're one hundred percent debt free. We're going in, then we can make it on Social Security at that point, and uh, and or a little bit of draw off of the the nest egg. That one seventy five will double about every seven years that you don't touch it. If it's in good growth, stock mutual funds averaging what the stock market is averaged. Including all these. I think that's what's so hard, too, is people just like in his position that are so close to retirement. And it's like the hit over the last two years. It's like, oh, man, it feels it feels defeating. Well, it, it's not as bad as the news reports. I mean, he probably had 200 in there. and Now he's got 175 or something. It's not like it went in half. Yeah. It, it did not go in half. But... It, it, but it's fear. To, but People to, are but to his point, it's the worst time to take it out. Right, right. You don't want to take it out at the bottom. Right. Or any of it, even enough to live on. So, mm-hmm. and uh, and since it's not a huge nest egg, then yeah, I'm probably going to work and leave the nest egg preserved, and not mess with Social Security right now, and go ahead and max it out. Um, the Social Security formula is pretty simple. It's very easy to do if you know when you're going to die. <laughs> 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 because it dies with you. And so the longer you wait to take it, the more you get. But the little shorter you live, the less that works. So, um, I mean, if you wait till 66 and a half, you get the maximum amount. But then if you only live to 70, that doesn't work out. Uh, and so if, if you, you know, if, if you kind of uh, ha- have longevity in your family and so forth, you want to wait to take it unless you have health problems that indicate you're not going to enjoy the same benefit. Yeah. So that's what you're facing. Rachel, good show today. Yes, thanks for having me on. Well done, James, Andrew, Zach, Ben, and Austin in the booth. The dudes in the booth. That's what we're going to start calling them, the dooth booth dudes. Oh, wow. That puts uh, this hour in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace. Christ Jesus. Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today.